Our men, his story. Our transformation, his glory. This is Disciple. Welcome to the Brotherhood. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Disciple Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Dibler. At Disciple, we're equipping men of God to walk boldly in the light and truth of God's word so that they can lead lives of ministry and mission and honor the call of the Great Commission. Got a special guest here tonight on the Disciple Podcast. This is wild. I've been looking forward to this day for many, many years. I am sitting with my wife, and this is the first time that she publicly is going to, you know, share a piece of her testimony and her experiences living and walking with me in the Christian faith. So, Kelly Dibler, welcome to the Discipled Podcast. Hi, everyone. She she's a little nervous, and we're we're sitting here huddled over this microphone, like Lady in the Tramp. <laughs> yeah, slurping on the same piece of spaghetti. Uh, so we're learning, and I apologize if the audio isn't perfect, but we're going to do our best with it. Um, I expect this to be a really unique experience. I'm so glad that we've got to this point where Ellie has found the courage to sit with me and do this because this is something that the Lord prompted me about um, about a year ago, and I brought it to her then um, because that was about the point in time when the whole disciple vision was manifesting. And I just felt like God was saying she's got to be a part of it because we are obviously in marriage together. We are one. And it just felt like she had to be along uh, for this process. I wanted her to share in the journey and share in the mission and, you know, be able to really embody all that this, this ministry is. Of course, we're a ministry for men, um, but, you know, kind of as the founding member of this community, I really wanted her to be tied into it. So I'm super excited that she's here. This is the most excited I've been to record any podcast ever because it's with my wife. And there may be things here that she will reveal that we haven't even discussed. I mean, I don't know. I don't know where God's going to lead this. We've prayed and we've surrendered it to his will and his design and we're going to allow him to move in the space. So I kind of dropped this into uh, my lap today. Yeah. (laughs) I tossed it into her lap this afternoon. And I just said, you know, I really feel like this is the perfect time to share this because we've got Valentine's day coming. So, and you know, marriage is a key component to the things that we discuss inside of our men's community at Disciple. That's really one of those areas that is a critical focus. Um, And you really get to hear kind of the stories of the relationships. I mean, we hear it inside of our community. We're praying for our men and their spouses all the time. But I thought this was really an opportunity for us to kind of showcase, you know, what the Christian walk looks like together in marriage and what it's been like living with me who, you know, I ventured out on a pretty radical path as it relates to my faith And this woman has had to stand by my side and deal with all of the, uh, well, I won't say consequences, but there's a lot that has come with it. And it hasn't always been an easy process. So I'm so thankful for her and so thankful to have the opportunity to to share the story with you all. But um, yeah, it's Valentine's Day coming up. Um, We may release this on Valentine's Day. I haven't really decided that yet. But Valentine's Day is a special day for us. It is the day that we got engaged, and it's also the day that we got married. We eloped uh, on a mm-hmm. beach in South Florida, which was not to the liking of most of our family. <laughs> we didn't tell anyone. We uh, we just took uh, two witnesses, uh, mm-hmm. friends of ours from North Carolina, and we flew down there and got married at uh, sunrise on the beach in South Florida. It was a beautiful day. So um, anyway, we're celebrating eight years of marriage. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So let's see where God leads us. I do want to get part of your testimony. Um, mm-hmm. And I kind of want to walk it back. So here, here's the interesting part about Kelly and I and our background. We grew up about 30 minutes apart from each other or so. Yeah. And, you know, our high schools, like they competed 
against each other in athletics and things. And I actually got to know some of my friends and I, we got to know like some of her friends at her high school over the years, like probably from about 10th grade through 12th grade. And what's wild is, is that Kelly and I never crossed paths, not one time that I can remember. Um, and we kind of discovered when we connected at about 30 years old that we had all these common connections. And it was like, what? You know her? Do you know him? How did we not run into each other? So it's kind of wild, but God just, you know, designed the timing, obviously, for us mm-hmm. to uh, to meet each other at a point in time when we were ready, mm-hmm. uh, which is a beautiful thing because leading up to us meeting each other, we were both on pretty, you know, ungodly paths, <laughs> I'll yeah. say. Um, so you guys know a lot about my story and my born again moment came uh, in 2011. So in the fall of 2011, I actually met Kelly, which I shared this on my podcast, uh, in February of 2012. So I was fresh out of that born again experience. Like that was the front end of December. And then I met Kelly at the front end of February. And I was still very much in, you know, kind of the recovery process from agoraphobia which meant uh, for me to like start dating someone was kind of a big deal because the isolation that I had been in for such an extended period of time, I mean, I didn't, I didn't leave my apartment. So when you're dating someone, typically you're, you know, going out to dinner or going to see movies or things like that. I really wanted a companion, particularly after I was born again and I just wanted to find the right woman, you know, and and the right woman that could identify with me and with my journey and um, who I had become in Christ. But uh, I, it, it kind of came about at random. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about how we found each other? I want to let you talk a little bit. <clears throat> Well, we met on Match.com. We did. There's a plug for Match.com, future sponsor of the Disciple Podcast. (laughs) Which, yeah, is the last place I would have ever thought I would meet someone. Um, I don't know. I was also coming out of a relationship and places that I was looking to find someone new were not the right places and... I don't know, one night I just sort of felt like this random nudge to join Match, which had never really crossed my mind before. And so I did. And Praise the Lord. <laughs> and um, I don't know, when you join Match, you sort of like, you can see people's profiles and you can, you know, take a look at just some things they've written about themselves or whatever. Um, And then as like a female, I don't know, I reached out to not just men. (laughs) It was only me. I was the only interest she had. Uh, Just a a few people that, you know, seemed to like. Caught her eye. Caught my eye. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, but then also, you know, then you get. Bombarded. Yeah, with lots of messages from people. So it's a little overwhelming at first. Um, yeah, and this is going to be her excuse, guys. So see, what happened was I was on Match.com and I, I dated a, a couple of different people through Match and it just was never like the right fit. And I felt like I was always driving to Philadelphia. We lived, at, both of us lived in southeastern Pennsylvania at the time. And it was like I was always driving an hour or an hour and a half to see somebody for dinner. And then it was just kind of like a waste of time. And I ended up getting off of it. And Kelly was still on or had just signed up and gave me like this little wink or nudge or whatever it was at that point in time. And Match actually marketing back to me said, this individual basically showed me like a piece of her profile and her headshot. And I saw that she was local to me, had nudged me. And I thought, Okay, well, um, she looks attractive. She's in my local area. Like, I wouldn't have to drive an hour and a half to see her. Like, this might be worth, you know, checking out a little bit. And so what ended up happening was um, I signed up (laughs) 
for a month just to go back on and kind of figure out who Kelly was. Um, he got a little promo rate for a month back on, and I messaged her. And then the irritating part was, and this is where she's going to say she just had so I many messages. I just have ignored it the first few times, the yeah. first few messages. Yeah. Three. Yeah, it took three messages until she actually responded back. Um, but anyway. But then it was good, and we talked a lot just through there at first and mm -hmm. I think we exchanged phone numbers and texted for a while which for me was like you know comforting just talking to somebody a little bit before actually even meeting you like in person yeah and we wouldn't advise this but then I invited D Kelly over for yeah. dinner um Don't but, go to strangers. <laughs> <laughs> but I was obviously a good guy um you know, and and it actually suited, and then I'll, I'll speak to this a little bit because it kind of suited my needs in that season. I was obviously, you know, kind of fearful about going out and doing things in public. And so um, naturally it made sense for me just to kind of invite her over to my comfort zone. Um, I was doing a lot better, but I hadn't broken the agoraphobia completely at that point. Um, so she came over for dinner one night and no, no long story short, like, here we are yeah. <laughs> 12 years later. <laughs> um, but I kind of wanted to get into because, okay. So obviously 2012, like I've had my born again moment. I'm on, I'm on the path. I still obviously have, as you guys know, from part two of my testimony, there's a lot of uh, maturing and growth that's going to occur over the next 12 years in my own faith journey. Um, but I've kind of found God in that season, not kind of, I mean, my identity is now rooted in Christ. And I'm obviously, I'm excited to share this with Kelly. She's not really in the faith at that point. And not to say that she doesn't believe there is a God, you know, um, and Kelly, you can talk, but uh, you, you grew up in the church, uh, but talk a little bit about your background and maybe why you drifted away and, and some of the things that you encountered in the seasons leading up to us, you know, meeting each other okay well yeah so i grew up in like a very traditional lutheran church similar to your experience yep. um in my household though it was just my mother my mother took us to church every sunday and she was very involved and my mom was always speaking about god and praying and um wanted that to be a big part of our lives but i just never really fully bought in, I guess. So yeah. yeah, I believed in God, but I didn't really know who he was. Yeah. Um, nor did I have a relationship with him. But um, so um as a teenager, young adult, she I was rebelling, just like was a little bit wild. Mm -hmm. Um you went through some relationships. I, I think like part of the rebelling steered her down the path of some relationships that, um, you know, were not the best fitting for her and also probably led her into perhaps a little bit of an identity crisis. Do you want to talk about some of that? Yeah. Um, I don't know what depth. I'm not going to make Kelly unpack her entire testimony. It's uh, very, my life has been very complicated. Uh, <laughs> no. So, I mean, yes, I, um, I didn't really ever feel like I had an identity, I guess you could yeah. say from the beginning. Um, I was always searching outwardly for things to, to I guess, fill the void that I yeah. had. Um, yeah, I was in one serious relationship that didn't work out. Um, I was... Yeah, and that one was really kind of... I planted some bad seeds, uh, the college relationship you're referring to. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, thanks. yeah. So, I mean, Kelly and I, like, when we met each other, that was one of the things that I think we had to kind of unpack a little bit was that there were some wounds there <clears throat> that really had kind of established a wall, kind of a barrier to intimacy in many ways because there were things that, in her past had traumatized her that, you know, she hadn't fully come to grips with or, you know, dealt with. 
And so it was hard for her to, um, you know, in a relationship, at least like early on for her to like open up to let her guard down. Yeah. I didn't trust anyone yeah. really. Um, yeah, I had been hurt pretty badly. And, and you also encountered some pretty crazy stuff. Um, so after college, Kelly uh, starts her, it was your first job, right? Your first Yeah, teacher. well, technically, yes. Yeah, so it was my first real teaching position. Um, I guess this was 2006. Yes, the fall of 2006. So I had just started my first teaching job and I was like super excited about it and really into it. Um, that has always been a passion of mine, just children and teaching them. So I was very excited and I was like putting my all into it, like teaching. And um, then around right after Halloween time, like I started getting, I felt sick. Um, and what did that feel like? It, like the flu or something? Yeah. At first it was sort of like a, felt like a sinus infection mm. or um, the flu. Yeah. Um, but it quickly like developed into like a cough and like just a overall feeling of just, I, I don't know, awfulness. I had gone to my um, primary care doctor actually like several times and was prescribed like antibiotics and just told like, you know, hydrate and rest and yeah. the basics. But I I would leave there feeling worse every time and the medications weren't doing anything. And then eventually um, I started developing like very high fevers every single day. And um, even one time at school, I like basically passed out in front of my students, which was super scary. Um, and so then I, like I said, I developed this cough, this like congestion that I just could not, you couldn't cough it out. Yeah, almost like an elephant standing on your chest, right? I mean, yeah, it it, it was like a drowning sensation. Mm -hmm. Yet there was nothing, nothing that was coming up. out. Yeah. No. And so, anyway, I had to um, take many days off of school. And at this point, it was like the middle of November, and um. I just remember this one day, like I couldn't even like lay down because as soon as I would lay down, I would start feeling like I was going to like suffocate. Yeah. And the coughing was like nonstop. And I just like, I was so feverish and so weak. I couldn't, I wasn't eating at this point. And I remember just waiting for my mom to come home from work. And as soon as she came through the door, I was like, I need to go to the hospital. Like I'm well. And so um, she drove me there and the entire time in the car, I was like laying in the back seat, just feeling like I'm going to die. Like I felt like I was going to die. And when we pulled up into the <clears throat> emergency room, um, I mean, everyone came like running out because I just, I really like wasn't breathing. So they did like my oxygen and everything. And it was like, like in the low 60s, I think, at that wow. point. And so, yeah, so that was the start of... Um, Quite a journey. Yeah, and it took, it even took the hospital um, some time to figure out what was going on with me. Sounds like, so I had something called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. It sounds like an infection, but it's actually not. It's like a disease of your lungs, and they don't, it's cryptogenic because they don't really know why I got it. And most 20 year old people mm -hmm. don't get this. Um, so anyway, I ended up being on a ventilator for about almost two weeks. Um, and then about the max that you can be on a ventilator. Correct. Yes. Before then. Yes. And they, it was during that time they had you in a like medically induced coma. Yes. Yeah, so then I was also put into a medically induced coma. Um, and there were several times, like I said, before they actually figured out what was going on with me, um, you know, where I'd had, I would have some days in the hospital where I wasn't 
like getting better. And they would tell my mom, like, you need to get family here or start, you know, Making thinking plans. about yeah. yeah, what you want to do if this doesn't, you know, get better. So But her mom was a prayer warrior. But yeah. So my mom, like I said, she had she has a relationship with God and she was asking for prayers everywhere. Like she would stop a person on the street and be like, My daughter is sick, you need to pray for her. Like um, obviously we had my church praying and, and many, many other people. Um, and so, yeah, the crazy thing about it is that as soon as they finally diagnosed me and figured out what it was and they realized how to treat it, um, then I started getting better. You responded pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So then she comes out of it. And interestingly enough, because I've had this conversation with Kelly and a lot of people like when they go through these near death experiences, um, you know, that's like the moment that they're born again. Right. Cause it's like, wow, God pulled me through this. Like I could have died here. I am praise the Lord. You know, I'm going to surrender my life and I'm going to change it moving forward. But at that point you weren't really ready. No, to I was angry because yeah. I was like, he, I was, 23 years old at the time I was like mom if there's a god then why did he allow me to be sick like this like here I am in my first job I'm like you know so excited about it and then I couldn't work like I couldn't go back to work for months and I was stuck at home I couldn't even like walk I had lost like 20 pounds um couldn't breathe. I had to basically like go to rehab several times a week, just, you know, building back up my lungs and then everything like that. So yeah, I was really angry with God and I um, kind of. Yeah, resentment for him, right? Like it was. Yeah. Because I felt like if, if there had been a God, then why would he allow me to suffer? Like why is there that? suffering? Yeah. I mean, this is a lot of everybody's big question, right? Why does God allow suffering? And, um, she had obviously experienced that on a pretty extreme level. And then at that time in your life too, there is a relationship that was established prior to her getting sick. Yeah. So I had started seeing someone, um, probably about five months, six months before this started happening. And we were very close, but um, this incident, I think, sort of like triggered in his mind also like, oh my gosh, I almost yeah, lost her. Died. Yeah. And so he ended up um, proposing to me um, not short, like not long after I got out of the hospital and just like in the vulnerable state that I was in, I said yes, but immediately knew that I, it wasn't right. Like I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I don't, how much do you want to share? <clears throat> it's where God's leading you, you know, we're not going to like force anything, but, um, I think this is a critical piece of your story and it may bring tears. Yeah. Um, but I'll be with you in it. So this is why we're here. Yeah. Let's do it. So, all right. Yeah, this was a very difficult time in my life. And I felt like I was basically like having hurt on top of hurt. Um, so I had just gotten out of the hospital. It was Christmas time. I had just gotten engaged, um, but felt like that was not the right thing to do. I was... Um, trying to like, you know, be happy about it and, and celebrate. And of course, everybody wants you to be happy and loves the idea of you like getting married and settling down and like, oh, Kelly's going to have this perfect little bundled up life. And yeah, now mind you at this point, like I'm not like physically like healthy right. at all. I am like stuck at home, like basically not doing anything. Um, yeah. And so somehow... Um, a month or so after this engagement, um, I'm seeing all my doctors and things and, um, you know, they're trying to get me like back on track and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get back on my birth control pill because that's just 
what I needed to be on. <laughs> and um, so in order to do that as a woman, like you need to make sure you're not pregnant. And my periods weren't starting yet because of being in the hospital. Yeah, and, all that you had been through. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> anyway, so just as like a precautionary measure, they give me a, a pregnancy test and then they'll, you know, call me with their results or whatever. Uh, and then I can start my pill as soon as like I take this medicine that will make my period start again. So I get a call like, I don't know, the next day and the nurse is on the other side and she's telling me like, look, I know you're not expecting to hear this, but you are actually pregnant. That is why your period hasn't started yet. Um, and yeah, I felt like my entire world just stopped and I, I mean, everything had just accelerated so yeah. quickly, like from engagement to now pregnant and she's still like in the midst of this recovery. Yeah. I'm trying to recover. I'm on like the most insane high dose of like prednisone that you can be on. And I'm supposed to be on it for a very long time in order for my like condition to not return. And so, um, yeah. So not long after I share this news with my fiance at the time and he was not excited about it because although he loved me and wanted to be with me, he also was not ready to, you know, start a family. We weren't, right. we didn't know each other that, that well. Um, so from the beginning, it was kind of like, I, I didn't feel ready for a child. He wasn't ready for a child. I was, felt like I'm on this medication and, um, I think in my mind, I just, that's what I held on to. It was like, I can't go through with this because I'm going to, I'm going to call it. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to not have a healthy child and it's going to be um, my fault. And so I unfortunately made the decision to have an abortion. Um oh. Yeah, so on top of, yeah, being very ill and then kind of like being thrown into this relationship uh, and then finding out I'm pregnant and then deciding I'm going to get an abortion. This is like all happening within just like a few months' time. Um, and that particular trauma just reinforced like the wall between Kelly and God. Yeah. Because with that there in place, it was like this barrier of shame and guilt and just all these negative feelings that it was like, how do I go to him? You know, how do I have a conversation with him after making that decision? So, Ultimately, <clears throat> Kelly does go forward and you get married. Yeah. And yeah. things don't really. No, the entire engagement, I knew it was not what I should be doing. But yeah, I followed through with it. And, you know, I just, it, it was never right. And so we were married probably only one year, a little over a year before I told him that I did not want to be in this marriage anymore. Um, and so then I was going through the hurt of a divorce and feeling the guilt of that because it was coming from my side completely. And um, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't really on board with it. This is more your decision. So it's like wham, bam, you know, barrier number two. Right. Cause now it's like, all right, abortion, divorce, like these are things that God doesn't think great of. Right. And it's hard mm -hmm. to then uh, pursue him and have a conversation with him because it's like you're, you're hiding. 
at that point. Like you, you don't want to be confronted um, by God. And so coming out of that, I mean, I guess what I know about your past post divorce and pre me was that there was a lot of just, yeah, just that running. Right. I mean, yeah. So I was just kind of partying a lot, going out, drinking, smoking, smoking weed. She's okay. It's okay. Nobody, there's probably a statute of limitations here. They're not going to come for you. Amongst other things. But <laughs> Maintaining some kind of state of inebriation, right? So that you didn't really need to deal with the feelings in many yes. ways. And Kelly was, yeah, I mean, a bit of a, a bit of a party goer, club goer, right? Used to run to New York City for the weekends and things like that. Um, that was kind of her thing. And uh so anyway, ultimately, is there anything you want to share about that particular season? Because then that you were still like when I met you and found you on match, I think like, so what happened that like triggered the interest in like, okay, maybe it's time to like meet someone. Um, <clears throat> so um, at this point I was, you know, this is terrible to even like, I was still teaching at this point. I was an elementary school teacher. and You're not the first person on this podcast to have done something a little, you know. Yeah. You'll be all right. <laughs> You're in good so, company here. We've I just story. felt like I I finally, like at one point, just realized like like how low I had fallen. Like, um, like I was like living this double life. Like during the day, I was this responsible person and I was, but then, you know, on the weekends or whatever, I was just somebody different and it was somebody I didn't like at all. And I just one day realized like, oh my gosh, like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I had also recognized that, yeah, the people that I was meeting and, um, coming into contact with were just not people that I wanted to like really have in my life. There was, even though I had a lot of people in my life, like because we were, you know, hanging out or whatever, uh, having a good time, there were not people that I could like, I didn't feel like I could trust or yeah. um, have a real like relationship with. So yeah, they were just acquaintances. They weren't, you know, yeah. And not necessarily people of the best character and things of that nature. So. No. And so, yeah. And that's sort of one. Yeah. Not, not long after that realization is when, yeah, it was like, okay, like something was just telling me like, you need to do something like totally different. Um, that's like where the match idea came from, I guess. Yeah. So then Kelly and I do meet each other and it's like, I can't, I mean, she's like the prettiest thing I've ever seen, which <laughs> truly, I mean, this first, uh, you know, a few times we got together, it was like, I could not let you go. We would stay up and talk to all hours of the night. She would have, you know, to teach in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> first graders, like, you need a full night of rest. She'd be leaving my apartment, like, at, yeah, like two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Going home, sleeping for a few hours and then. And then like she'd leave school and come back and we would just hang out again and again. And it, um, yeah, I mean, it just took off and like she was such a uh, critical piece. And I shared this a little bit on the podcast, but of my recovery journey too, because she then, I mean, you've got this beautiful love interest in your life and you want to obviously, you know, pursue that. Well, it just, pushed me out of my comfort zone. It was like God placed her in my path at the perfect time to kind of accelerate the process of me moving out of the captivity of agoraphobia. And, um, you know, I remember like some of those early days I lived in this apartment complex where there was like a restaurant nearby, like that we could kind of like yeah. walk to. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, that was like those baby steps that would get us there. And then we could mm -hmm. come back. Um, but she was patient with me and and kind of understood the the situation that I had been in and what I was coming out of. And 
what's remarkable is, I mean, we started kind of the dating process in February and um, by July, because it was 4th of July weekend or yeah. week or whatever, mm -hmm. um, we got on an airplane and went to California. And that was like a massive step um, because I didn't leave my apartment. I didn't leave my apartment to like go to the mailbox. California was all the way across the country. And the other thing, if you guys heard my testimony that was critical about California is that's like the place where I first encountered anxiety when I was 19 years old. Uh, and it was very extreme there. And I hadn't been back um, since, you know? So this was like my chance to go look that demon in the eye, you know? And I took her with me and, you know, it was a great little trip. Unfortunately, the weather didn't <laughs> work out for us. I'm, I'm bragging up California like, oh, it's, it the, was crap. it's the best, you know? <laughs> and it's like overcast and cold the whole time we were there. I think we did get yeah. one day on the No, beach. we still had a good trip. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that was kind of the start of our relationship. And then, you know, since after that, um, we took a lot of big leaps in faith together. And let me tell you, like I, as a, as a man who was on fire for God, but didn't know what in the world he was doing with it. You know, I was spraying in a lot of different directions. I didn't really have myself reeled in, you know, and I wasn't utilizing discernment properly. Like I would get the nudge from the Holy spirit as I've shared, like in, my testimony too. And it, you know, say like, Hey, steer clear of that, <laughs> come back this way, you know? And at that point I thought I could still kind of roll the dice a little bit more, you know, and kind of play my hand and say like, Hey God, you know, I know you're not really in favor of this, but I'm pretty sure it's going to work out. So I'm just going to give it a try. Well, this poor sap <laughs> had to ride along with me for that journey. So, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> She's been through a lot. Let's just say that. And at that point too, you know, I'm born again and um, I'm sharing that faith with her and she's starting to like warm up to the idea of it. But there was a lot of, I mean, full disclosure, like people see us on social media and at times they think like, oh, you guys have like the perfect relationship and the perfect family. And let me tell you, it's a grind to get here. Yeah. I mean, we had to fight through a lot of different messes and a lot of it was kind of unpacking our own stuff, my stuff, her stuff, you know, a lot of obstacles as it related to like communication and, you know, tearing down the walls and different past traumas that would rear their ugly head and create some kind of emotional response that may have not even been, you know, from us, like in our interactions, it could have been something from buried way deep in the past that just happened to show up that day, you know? And that, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, but I mean, I think that came from both ends, but I know like some of the traumas that she had from relationships or not just that, but kind of the weight that she was carrying with a divorce and an abortion and things like things that had gone unresolved in her faith journey were probably, you know, making you vulnerable or prone to, to some of that too, to a certain degree. Yeah, I mean, I had very big walls up and... Um, I used to plead with Kelly. Like, I I would beg her to have, like, an intimate conversation with me and um, let the walls down. But that that just made things worse. So keep that in mind, guys. Like, <laughs> you can't force it out of them. Um, uh, you know, but you can continue to pray. And... God does that work. Like there are things that are supernatural that have to happen for somebody to be transformed and, you know, born again and regenerated and that like, they're not in your hands. And I think a lot of times like we, uh, as men in particular, and at first, you know, Kelly would probably say like, I'm a control freak or I'm a fixer. Or I like to, you know, take charge of things. <laughs> But I've learned through my community that I'm not the only one like that. There, it's kind of a thing with men, you know, is like we we want to fix it. And um, 
you know, sometimes you have to humble yourself and recognize that that is out of your control. Like the best thing that you can be is present and supportive. And you've got to just remain in faith and prayer that in God's timing, it'll happen. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, um, you know, watching me, watching your relationship with God grow was a great thing. And I know you wanted it so much for me too, that like you said, sometimes you would sort of push it, push it on me, which I think had the, you know, reverse effect. effect. Yeah. yeah. Like, and then I would not, you know, I, I wouldn't want to yeah. go there. The wall would just get taller, you know, cause it's like, are you serious? Yeah. And then the resentment, some of it that she might've felt, towards God, like started coming towards me too. It's like, you're not going to tell me how to do this. Um, yeah. So, it was a very complicated. It was. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't make it easier either because there were things like that were unresolved in me that, uh, you know, put her through that. Honestly, there were certain decisions that I were, was making um, that made me look like a hypocrite. Right. You know, like one of the things that I mentioned, uh, like a gambling addiction, right. Um, that was something that I gave up prior to being born again. But then I came up with this little alternative workaround through the stock market and Kelly like supported me initially when I brought to her attention that I wanted to invest some money. But then like when she could see what it was doing, uh, she had, the wisdom to say like, this is not going to be it for you. I feel very strongly that like, this is not going to be the avenue to you gaining any wealth or making any money. Like, this is just not it. And I fought that, you know, because I had my idea of how it was going to work. And so I didn't want to hear that. And of course, like things like that, you know, they put up an additional wall because it's like, come on, man, like you're, a man of God, you're not really living it if your lifestyle is still rooted in, you know, this sin. And you may have reframed it in such a way that you believe it's okay, but like, look at what it's doing to you and look at the division it's creating in our marriage. Um, we did, yeah, I'm saying in our marriage, um, because that was, I probably, I started down that path prior to us getting married. Yeah, yeah. And then it, you know, kind of trickled into like the front end of our marriage. It was not until like our son was born in 2017 that I ultimately set it aside. But, uh, it, you know, that was a battle that I kind of butted heads with her on because I just did not want to let go. And it's one that I was obviously butting heads with God on too. So, you know, I've seen this play out with other men of our community, like how God will use a woman. And and this woman was not even fully surrendered herself, but God was utilizing her to, you know, mold and shape me. Um, here I am trying to steer her down the path of her faith. And in the meantime, she's actually helping me to grow. So that was kind of a cool thing. <laughs> yes. I don't often God thank her. Cool. I don't often <laughs> thank her for that kind of stuff, um, which I should. Kelly's actually been, um, I can get into this in a little bit, but um, she's been a huge influence in my faith, uh, particularly since, you know, kind of her born again experience because um, she's got really good discernment <laughs> and uh, she's got a real like appetite for the, the real truth, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I appreciate that because that's what I'm after. That's what the guys in our, you know, community are after. And um, it's helped me to dismantle some things because I'm vulnerable in a sense. Like sometimes um, I'll allow myself to venture off into, you know, a direction that is a little more risky in nature and she'll reel me back in. But um, before we get to that, let's kind of, uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, maybe how we get to that point. Because obviously there's a lot of life stuff going on. Like we, we went through, we moved to North Carolina, left mm -hmm. everything that we knew 
in Pennsylvania, all family, no friends in North Carolina. We just picked up and <laughs> decided we were going to move um, because, you know, we really just wanted to kind of like venture out on our own and have a new experience. I was in 2013, so not, you know, a year after, a year and a half, yeah. something like that, mm-hmm. after we started dating. Um, we moved down there together. She found a teaching job and I was still working remote. Um, but moved we into this. <laughs> yeah. Like 700. No, I don't even know if it was that big. <laughs> it was small. 600 some square foot uh, loft. So the ceilings were tall. It made it feel bigger. But um, this, yeah, it wasn't necessarily ideal, but it was different. It was an adventure. It was an adventure. And I had a house in Pennsylvania that I was trying to sell, which I thought would sell quickly. Here's another, you know, I talked about this on my podcast too, but another area of like discipline, because that was something I should have never gotten involved with in the first place, but I was trying to impress this new lady and, you know, play the part of the guy that had it all together and make this silly purchase on a home and then try and get rid of it a year later. And it, becomes a massive obstacle. Um, so we were renting and paying a mortgage in Pennsylvania and that was a hard yeah, that couple was of years. I had a crazy experience that I ventured into from an employment perspective that was driven by my appetite for the stock market that didn't pan out and it was, yeah, ugly. So there was a lot of resetting and Kelly had to endure all of that. Um, and she's been patient and she's trusted me throughout the entire process. And we've always, praise the Lord, had enough and found a, ma- a way to make things work or he's made a way for us to make things work in his mercy and grace. Because there were be- there were so many times that, um, and it, a lot of it was just my doing and my immaturity. Um, so anyway, uh, as we get to, you know, say... Uh, it was 20, 2015, we, we get engaged. Um, 2016, on Valentine's Day. Yeah. We get married. Yeah. And then we have our first child. Kelly was all like ready to have kids. I remember on our honeymoon, <laughs> <laughs> we're in the pool and stuff, and she's like having this conversation with me like, this may our be, may be our last trip together. And I was like, uh, like our last trip together alone. <laughs> and I looked at her like, for real like and it just honestly it kind of like because we had had at that point like you know four years of dating she had to wait a while for me to actually propose i was 32 at the time so so she's I like oh, ticking. clock's ticking you know we got to get this baby process started so um no but i was definitely ready yeah she was and i was scared to death because uh and that's another thing that kelly helped me to grow in was, um, you know, kind of letting go of my need to control that process with starting a family, because I felt like I better have the means to provide, I better have everything lined up. And if I don't like, I'm not starting, you know, well, I would have been dead because we'd still be waiting. (laughs) Yeah. Like there would have been no start because it was just not going to happen. And not a perfect moment. No. And which, you know, but there are not perfect moments and then there are my moments, you know, but Hey, <laughs> we roll with it because we trust God. Um, so we did start the, the family process, um, that fall. And then my son, our son was born. I got to remember who I'm recording with. Here. <laughs> our son was born in, in July, um, the following year. And then a lot of things obviously change. Um, you know, Kelly stepped away from work completely. We made the decision that we would, you know, allow her to be a stay at home mom. That was obviously important to her. And I would say like, you know, prior to even you having your born again experience, like that was like your ministry. It was like, this is. Yeah. I mean, I always felt like I'm supposed to be a mom and I'm going to I want to be home with them and I want to be the one that's, you know, influencing them the most. And yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm grateful for you for allowing me to do that. It was, I mean, it's a sacrifice. Like I never really made enough money to compensate for 
like two incomes. Um, but when you look at it too, I mean, she not was, that my income was huge. She was teaching, <laughs> and then if you had to consider putting your children into daycare, like it's kind of like the teaching salary and the daycare sort of even themselves yeah. out. And it was then you're foregoing all those, you know, really critical years with your kids, and um, we neither one of us wanted that, and so. Like in a way it's a sacrifice, but in another way, it's like, I would, I would advise everybody to do it that way. I would say like, that's the way God designed it. You know, um, obviously there's a lot of working moms that are, you know, very successful and, and are good at still managing their households. But, um, I just, for our family, like that was our preference and, um, you know, it has been a real blessing. That doesn't mean it's easy. No, it's not easy at all. Not- <laughs> yeah, and and we thought like when we had the the first child, it's like, you know, our first child was pretty needy, um, sensitive. Like he had a lot of the things that yeah. probably she and I both embody. You know, like um, little anxieties and quirky things and stuff. Um, but we thought we had our hands full then, and then we had, yeah, we had two more. <laughs> and I, I didn't get to do this at the beginning, but how many times do you guys hear a podcast with a 34 week <laughs> pregnant woman? Yeah, I'm very pregnant right now. <laughs> I texted my buddy tonight and I said, how many podcasts do you hear with a woman who's that far along in her pregnancy? Like, I don't, I don't think I've heard one. This woman, I mean, there's, I'm sitting here next to her. There's like kicks running up against my arm. We can feel this baby moving. Yeah. Yep. Is, so we're about to have our fourth baby, yeah. which is kind of crazy, crazy because after two, uh, you were, you were yeah, satisfied. I, well, I kind of thought like all along, if I was going to have kids, which again, like I was resistant to it. But then once we started down that path, it's like, we're going to have two. Like, you know, it's like standard. Yeah. We had the boy, we had the girl. And so. Check the boxes. Yeah. And in my heart, I never felt like done, but I also. Yeah, she would say that and I'd be like. Mm, come. Felt like, okay, if you're really done, then all right. Like. So in a way. Before we go to that story, because that's a cool story. And by the way, this is going to be one really long episode because I don't think we should need to break it up, but this is going to be a good one. Um, so 2020 rolls around. 2020 is obviously like a crazy year for yeah. everybody. Yeah. So our daughter, our first daughter is born October in October 2019. So right before yeah. COVID. Happens. And at that point, like, I don't know, like I was a year and a half into my employment with uh, a company that I was like having some success, but then this uh, recruiter reached out to me. I've shared this story before um, through LinkedIn and I decided to hear her out. They got a job offer and took it uh, with a new company. Um, and I was starting in January of 2020. And then of course, you know, a couple months into that, the COVID thing takes off and everybody goes remote and I was already remote, but everybody went remote. And um, they put me on a comp reduction of like 30%. And I had taken this job thinking that it was going to be a a huge financial blessing for our family because I was making more money. And then instantly it was gone. And uh, three months later, I'm let go uh, with a few others. And so it was weird. In that season, I had started, you know, doing more in my uh, content ministry, if you will. I started sharing a lot more about my mental health journey, because I just knew that people were being isolated through the pandemic um, and people were struggling with anxiety and depression and there was suicide at like higher levels than we had seen in many, many years. And like, so I just knew they had to do something. And of course, I'm not going to ignore the victor in my story. Like I was putting God on that platform and this ministry starts budding. And at the same time that I have this collision in my faith journey where it's like, I'm seeking deeper intimacy with the Lord. And I get introduced to a guy, um, who, and if you want this story, you can go well into the depth of it in my book. Um, but I will say that it was kind of like a spiritual mentor of sorts that, uh, starts steering me down the path of a lot of the new age occult stuff. So, it was really weird because, um, again, I was on fire in my faith in one sense, but in the other, I was heading down this path of deception. And of course, 
Kelly's walking alongside me through all of this. I've just lost my job. And I'm going deeper, but I'm maybe going deeper in the wrong direction. Um, and there's like this process that unfolds over a couple of months where I reveal the deception. Ultimately, God does. Praise the Lord. Like, And it was really the backbone of scripture that had been planted in my heart, in my psyche for many years. It was like the knocking at the door on my brain that helped me to reveal it in the end. But it could have been very destructive. Um, but I came out of that and then ultimately... Um, that led me to write my book where I shared my testimony and exposed all of this evil. And, um, you know, Kelly stood by me in that season where it was like, I didn't have traditional work. We had some savings and it was the savings essentially that was from her retirement from the state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And we lived off of that, that and unemployment, you know, at the time there was unemployment and the pandemic, uh, additional benefit or whatever. And, um, we got by, I, I still don't like to this day, looking back, I don't really know how God, cause we had two children and no income for a period of nine months or so. I still don't know how those ends met, you know, but somehow he made a way. Um, what was wild was that then became like the greatest transformational season in my life, uh, you know, where just amazing things begin to unfold. And of course, like the book launches a podcast, whatever. That was also the, the time when, um, I ended up losing my father. But in that same season, Kelly starts going down a path of greater depth in her faith walk too. And I think part of it was triggered by, where I was going and like my appetite. And for a while I was kind of like pulling her into this deception before I, you know, was able to discard of it. But at the same time, we were having some really powerful conversations. And I think we both kind of understood that like that wall had to come down. Yeah. Like there, there was something that was really unaddressed in there that was going to linger until she dealt with it. And so I think this is a good opportunity and time for you to maybe share what happened there and like how that resulted in you being born again. All right. Well, let's see. Yeah. So it's kind of like when you have done something very bad, you know that your parents know, but you like refuse to acknowledge it and you just like, go about your day pretending like, you know, day after day. That... So anyway, yeah, I figure um, I just finally had like a honest conversation with God where it was me telling him how sorry I was. So finally like admitting. Um, your responsibility essentially. Yeah. Because you know? I think that's like what a lot of us do is – um when we know we're in the wrong and we don't want to address it, like that was the big thing with me was like, hey, uh, stop pointing the fingers and own it, you know? Um, and I think that's what you kind of did in that moment, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just like finally, like it was like a true like repentance, I I would say, for yeah. what I had done. Um and, you know, knowing that he already knew it anyway, it was like I could finally be just, like, open and honest and, um, like, go to him in a different way, though. And I wasn't seeing it as, like, him, like, scolding me yeah. anymore. Yeah, it was like he was asking like, you to come home. He's been waiting out of that conversation. Yeah, and so it became that I was um, going to him for comfort because he already, of course, knew what had happened. And um, it was definitely like a like life-changing moment. So I started to feel... I don't know, 
like a new identity almost. I mean, yeah, because I wasn't hiding anymore, even though I yeah. like, I was just kind of pretending like in my mind the entire time that like this hadn't happened and, and I didn't want, I didn't want God looking at me, you know, in like, like with disdain or yeah. You know, yeah. And he obviously wasn't, you know, he was just no, waiting for you wasn't. to repent. And what's amazing is so in the time that follows that, like I started noticing changes quickly, you know, um, and Kelly's like, I don't know, your, your appetite for your faith just changed. Like, almost instantly. And then it got to the point where like, I've been invested in this journey for eight years or something at that point, but she's helping me to grow then, you know, because there's like a renewed vigor about her that is revealing things to her that then she's sharing with me. And it's like, whoa, you know, it's kind of remarkable. Um, go ahead. Well, I think um, I just finally like allowed myself to see the truth. Yeah. And feel how much God loved me and loves me no matter mm -hmm. how. How hard you fall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so once you realize that, I mean, there's nothing else that can really present an obstacle because like at that point you you know you bear your soul before the only judge then who can judge you the thing that I've found so incredible about Kelly is, is that she's become such a pro-life advocate and now even tonight you guys have no idea what it took in the past for her to talk about, you know, that experience in abortion. Now she can actually share it and like the wound has healed. And so she can use it. She's essentially armed with, you know, this transformation that allows her to minister to others that may be in a space where they're vulnerable and they're considering something like that. So it's, again, it's God taking what the enemy meant for evil and turning it for good. Right. Yeah. So it, it flipped the situation upside down. Um, and here's the, the beautiful thing about that. So both of us essentially prior to meeting um, should have been dead. Uh, you know, I mean, really. And I think that would, you would say that that gave you a new appreciation for the renewing of your life too and all that he carried you through to bring you to that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and just seeing the power then of the prayer that was offered for her in that season too. And even though she was rejecting him after he had miraculously healed her, the love was still there it endured all of that, you know, and all of the walls that she had put up, like they're gone, they vanish. And, um, you know, so she's at this point, just you know, like a completely different person. Um, and so she starts inviting in, you know, more of like the miraculous and the supernatural and we're just open to things like how is God going to move? Right. Um, and we don't really like question things anymore. It's like, if it's, if it's his intent and I'll, I'll bring it back to, you know, her kind of feeling that we weren't done from a child perspective. Um, she was right. <laughs> Our God was right. Cause maybe he, he was just like planning that, nudge inside of her but what's remarkable is he starts just continuing to bless us in ways beyond our comprehension because we're open to it at this point it's like you know open arms like we believe in your ability to transform the both of us 
and you're steering the ship now, we're surrendered, and so let your will be done. Um, and so from a child perspective, <laughs> we got grace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is cr this is crazy. So um, <clears throat> December of 2020, 20. yeah, gosh, I'm going to get three years right. December of 2020, um, we just have one of those days where it's like, you know, you can tell everything's just, I don't know how to explain it, but everything, like there was just great chemistry throughout the day and whatever. And our kids were listening. Our kids were, it was like God set the stage perfectly. And, uh, you know, we were intimate and it was one of those times, like one of the very few times that we don't, you know, or hadn't used something protection wise it was just kind of like and and we didn't even think of twice about yeah, it yeah because i was like going to get my period like any day like it was already late yeah no no it was like so well, it was like like she was on me, day so 36 of like 30, a 28 37 30, i'm sorry you always say that <laughs> now i'm gonna i'm gonna hear it after we hang up this podcast so, so yeah, day 37 was, of a 28 day cycle. Nonetheless. Yes, because I was still breastfeeding my my daughter. Yeah. Um she wasn't really like having So I was having periods, but they were not yeah. super like consistent, but I knew that I was due for a period, like at any day. And so yes, we had like unprotected sex on day 37 of my cycle, thinking like I'm gonna get my period, you know, tomorrow. And it just, it never shows. So yeah, here's the, here's the cool thing. Um, so that was like December 12th. Cause we know the day. Um, which is, Cause there was literally one yeah, day. That it was <laughs> but we go home to Pennsylvania for Christmas. Cause we're living in um, North Carolina mm -hmm. at this point. And um, we're there and it, I didn't know this was going to be um, my dad's last Christmas with us. And my dad was really close, not only, you know, with me, obviously my father and my best friend, but you know, I had a close relationship with Kelly too, which was special. Um, but I remember, so it was December 23rd when we got home and, uh, you know, we're sitting in my parents' house and my mom and dad were joking because we had just put the two kids to bed and which was always, <laughs> always an adventure. And then, um, we came back downstairs and we're sitting with them and they're like, why don't you have another one or something like that? Or it wouldn't be funny if you had another one or wouldn't your hands be full if you had another one. And we kind of like laughed about it. But in that moment, we knew that Kelly still hadn't gotten her period. And so we kind of like snickered to each other. And then the next day is Christmas Eve and she's like, um, maybe we should like get a pregnancy test. So I run over to the little Walmart locally and I pick up one and in secret, she goes out and takes a test and, calls me out to the kitchen and is like, Hey, uh, look, <laughs> and she's pregnant. So we found out on Christmas Eve, like what a blessing, what a gift, um, that she was pregnant. And obviously we were, you know, a little, she was overwhelmed. I was, I was like trying to receive. Very it. shocked. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was, yeah, an amazing, beautiful thing. Um, we got to share that news with my father before he passed. Um, Unfortunately, of course, uh, he, he died on uh, April 1st of 2021, so he never got to meet Grace. Um, but when she came out, she was just like, she looked exact. She had every feature of my dad. and um, She still looks like him. Yeah, and it was a really special thing because, you know, there was, obviously there's a void left. Um, but God, you know, in his mercy and grace, um, gave us this incredible blessing that uh just you know i remember kelly being at um my dad's funeral and she was pretty pregnant at that point and, and um yeah i mean we just we were really fortunate to um to have had that experience and to have grace and what was interesting was um when grace was born uh we had this awesome nurse that was taking care of kelly and uh she was just, you know, super friendly and whatever. But when she walked into the room, she said, hi, my name is Faith. <laughs> yeah. So Faith was with us to deliver grace, which was 
a pretty cool thing. And Grace had not an easy delivery, by the way, um, because her mm -hmm. umbilical cord was around her neck. That's an interesting story, too. Kelly had desired to, when we got to South Carolina, she desired to get into this uh, OB clinic, um, and they weren't taking patients like at her stage of pregnancy or whatever. And there was a doctor there that had a good reputation. And, you know, we obviously never got to see her. Well, it just happened that she was on staff. Um, she was the doctor on call. When yeah. I went into labor, the only doctor in the hospital. And she came in and like just business got it yeah. done because it was a scary moment. Yeah. Um, Grace had a tight knot uh, around her neck yeah. with the umbilical cord around her neck. She was going into distress and heart rate dropping like dramatically. Yeah. Um, and so instead of rushing me into a, an emergency C-section, um, yeah, this doctor, um, Moved did what she me. needed to do and got it done. And then, uh, mm -hmm. so Grace is born and we run into her at our church. Our yeah, church. Our, yeah that she goes to our Grace. church, which is just amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, God worked it all out. And then, um, you know, now Kelly is 34 weeks pregnant with, uh, <laughs> baby number four. And, uh, you know, the blessings just continue to flow and we're both getting up there in age, you know, um, but, uh, I'm 41, and um, gosh, that that seems hard to say. <laughs> like Kelly's 40. Yeah. Um, so one month before I turned 40, we found out we were pregnant with this baby. And, and you know, again, that was another one of those days. I it's we a really planning this one again, but but we did leave the door open. It for was God kind of to like move. if this is meant to be, then it'll be. We'll give it this like one little shot again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> and here we are. And so uh, it's weird, but it's almost like as soon as that took place, and again, I could probably pinpoint the day, I just knew Kelly was pregnant. <laughs> it's, God almost just gives us that assurance. And that's been such a blessing, um, you know, because you look around and you see how many people are, are really challenged with, um, you know, having children and, God in his mercy has just blessed us so richly. Um, yeah. And my heart is with those women. This is not a. Yeah. No, we're not. About that. But yes, we've been blessed. And honestly, with my past and what I've just revealed. So this is another kind of just forgiving me. Like he's blessed me with these four children. Yeah. It's incredible. Like we don't, we don't even, deserve no. this. Obviously, none of us deserve the blessings we receive. Um, but, you know, it's it's rich. Now, we are rich from the perspective of children and family and things of that nature. Um, we're not rolling in it, you know, and we don't have a lot figured out. And that's probably like the bigger piece of this story is just that um, our life is truly um, surrendered. Like we we don't have the plan in place. I mean, it's truly like we need God to move. Like financially, we have obstacles like a lot of you do. And we don't have the means to address them in our own strength. We're waiting for God. Um, but the thing is, is that we, our trust is on like a higher level now than it's ever been. Um, we really just recognize that you know, amidst all of like the chaos in the world today, um, you know, there are things, and this was a hard thing for me because I was the control freak. I wanted to have things planned and figured out. Um, but we've truly l been able to lean into our faith and surrender every aspect of our lives to his will and design. And it's, um, that doesn't make it easy. There are days that it like literally torments our flesh and we can be emotional and reactive and we can be led into, you know, sin. We can fight with each other. And, but at the end of the day, our faith continues to ground us and steer us back towards, uh, you know, a greater intimacy and reliance on him for all things. And so, 
I think that's one of the great things that comes with these additional blessings that we've been given to steward is that it, it comes to a point where it's like, it's beyond our capacity to serve them. Not only like from uh, putting a roof over their head and food in their mouths and things like that perspective, but also like as a mom, a stay at home mom with, you know, a two, four and six year old and a baby coming here in the next month or so, you can't do that in your own strength. Like talk about that for a minute as a mom, because like it takes super, and I've seen this woman. Okay. So when I knew Kelly earlier in life, like, I love sleep. She loves to sleep. I mean, I'm not trying to like get her up on like, now granted, she worked with little kids all week long teaching and Which stuff. It's exhausting, but yeah. But like not Saturday like mornings, that. I'd be like ready to go. She's like chilling at like 11 o'clock or whatever. Like, yeah, good luck. I hope you got your fill because that ain't happening anymore. Mm -hmm. But anyway, like what God has been able to do with her is just remarkable like her strength and perseverance and breastfeeding exclusively three children and now coming on a fourth it's it's remarkable but again it's like we can't do this parenting yeah, thing it's not it's not me no so i think that's a good message like to share is that i've been saying this with my son because he just went through a, a surgery but if he leads you to it, it'll lead you through it. Um, and, you know, it's like he's not going to provide the blessings and then not provide the provision. Like that's mm -hmm. not, we serve a good, good father, you know, like he will make a way, he will clear a path, whether that needs to be financial, you know, windfalls that need to come into our lives or if it's just fuel that we need in order to <laughs> maintain our sanity among raising four little kids, like he'll do it. We don't need to know how. Um, that's the beauty of like the surrender and truly living in faith. Um, you have anything you want to add to that? Because I feel like what you do is well pretty incredible. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, no, it is exhausting, but um, it's like you said, it's God provides. I used to be of the mindset like, um, you know, how can you pour from an empty cup yeah. and you need to fill your own cup in order to um, fill others. But then I've realized like our cups are, are never full and they never will be full, but they're being continuously like filled mm -hmm. by God. So it's just like a continuous thing. So that's why you have to on a daily basis feed your life yeah. with him. Um, so even if it's, you know, you start your day with a few minutes um, in his word or just. Yeah, in a prayer, because honestly, you don't get a lot of opportunities. I mean, Kelly yeah, and I are sitting yeah. here, you know, recording this podcast. It's like, we should be asleep. Um, our kids are barely in bed um, and mm -hmm. they're probably going to wake up at some point throughout the night or shortly, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and she's 34 weeks pregnant. But so it's like, you gotta make the most of your moments. Um, the other thing that I think it does is it disciplines you to um, put your time in, in the right places. Like we're not consumed yeah. by, <clears throat> we don't have shows that we watch. We're not no, like we don't binge watching watch Netflix TV. or anything like that. <laughs> you know, um, our kids pretty much own any of the TV time on Amazon Prime or whatever, but um, our time is really, and I don't know, I mean, th this doesn't make us better than anyone else. I'm not saying it from that perspective. It's just like you recognize that you only have so much time. And so if you're going to use it, like use it wisely. So it's maybe we listen to a sermon or something if we actually have yeah. time together. Um, Little yeah. things too in our house, like we're often listening to just like, you know, praise music yeah. and just... Keep the praise music going. Yeah, that helps. It does. Mm -hmm. Especially like to start the day. We have one of those Alexas, you know, and just sometimes it's hard to get going. Um, but that kind of puts it in the right frame, you know. Um, right. And just like just taking <clears throat> one day at a time. Yeah. Like if you think too far ahead, which 
you know, Jesus told us. Yeah, why worry about tomorrow? Specifically, Today yeah. Of its own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you don't ever think ahead, of course, or, you know, be responsible, but it's just that you just take each day as it comes. Like, because if I think about, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to be waking up with a newborn baby soon and breastfeeding multiple times a night and then waking up with my other kids and, you know. And she does do that from time I to time. I do. You have to reel yeah. it back in. Yeah, yeah. That, that thought can become super overwhelming. And then, but then I get stuck in like those negative places. So instead I just, you know, okay, you think about it and then you know that like God is going to keep filling your your cup. So you're going to be tired perhaps, but you'll get through it. It's- now you said, I have a saying 24 hours for eternity. Mm-hmm. So live it 24 hours at a time for eternity. So if you keep the eternal mindset and you don't go into that place where you're focused on like what is temporary and what like the pain of the day is the affliction or the hardship or the struggle or whatever, but you're looking towards eternity and just looking at the day one at a time, as opposed to like getting so involved, because you can't really live in faith if you're like making plans for five years down the road, you know, because you don't know, you make a plan today, God may have a completely different interest for your life, you know, a month from now, and he may redirect you. I think we've seen enough redirections to know that he moves in that way. And a lot of us like from the, you know, brotherhood of faith that I've got, you know, I see this happening all the time where it's like, I was just having um, a conversation with one of our brothers over the weekend where it's like he's been serving uh, in the youth ministry capacity at his church for a long time. And now he's like being steered down this completely different path that is well out of his comfort zone to serve in the senior community. He's like, I don't know, this is kind of like strange, you know, like this isn't like where I've been a fit in the past. But again, God moves us into places where he needs us. Like, and so we got to, We got to trust him and like be open to, you know, shifting at a moment's notice because he needs us somewhere else, you know? Um, And I think if we're like making all these concrete plans for life, it's like that's reinforcing this idea that we have some level of control that we don't have, you know? It's it's all literally in his hands and it's all going to unfold, you know, according to his will. Um, By the way, if you can hear that little, that's her rubbing her belly. And he's probably starting to kick around. He's like, hey, you know, what's going on? <laughs> so baby, say hi. We're having a boy, but we're not going to reveal the name. It may or may not come from the Old Testament. Um, <laughs> and now she's mad. She's like, somebody We have a balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I said it may or may not. I mean, not. <laughs> Maybe it's the New Testament. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe a middle name from the New I mean... Uh, Okay. <laughs> All right. So to wrap this up, put a bow on it, as they say, because this has been a good conversation. I want you to maybe share a little bit because I think it's important. We have obviously a men's community and we've got a lot of great women that are supporting these men inside of the community. And it's one of those things that we talk about a lot, you know, is marriage. And um, it's one of the, I mean, if, in our prayer request channel, it's probably one of the areas that's addressed most frequently. Um, and we do have a lot of women that actually follow our community and listen to our podcasts and things of that nature. But like, if there were something that you could share about what it's been like to journey with me <laughs> over the last 12 years to kind of get to this point and what it's taken from like an endurance and patience perspective, or is there anything that you would share like as advice um, to perhaps a spouse who's got, a, you know, a husband on a journey or advice to perhaps one of the men of our community that might need to offer a little more understanding to their spouse or mm, <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm putting her on. Well, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, uh, frame up any questions. She was like, what are we going to talk about? I was like, we're going to let it up to God. So, you know. Here we are. I'm dumping it in. Or- yeah, I'm not good on the spot. Even. Um, well, honestly, like I guess, I guess my advice for like wives um, would be just to remember that your husband is human, 
Um, no, but really, like Matt is a a really great guy, but I cannot expect him to be perfect. And although he loves God with all of his heart, like, and he embodies a lot of like the characteristics of him, he he will never be him. He will never be perfect. Right. And so I think that sometimes we kind of like put our spouse in on like a pedestal or like kind of have expectations of them that are not realistic. Um, and that goes both ways. Yeah. Because I do that does. better too. Um, and so I think it's just important to remember that like God also gave you your husband for a reason. And so you have like many strengths that kind of like I do not have. But then also you may have areas where I can mm -hmm. help you. Um, and I do want to touch on that before we stop because she has. And I want to be clear that, like, um, I'm not a guy that likes to admit uh, he's wrong. <laughs> not a lot of guys do. But, um, you know, she's reeled me in on a number of things as it relates to faith and um, has steered me down the path at times of more sound biblical teaching, which has been helpful um, and has really, like, I've adopted most of what she has shared with me as kind of like my core beliefs. Um, obviously a lot of them were already established, but there were some areas where like I was prone to maybe drift a little bit and um, part of like my curiosity as it relates to like the supernatural and things of that nature, like she would kind of steer me back in. And again, that was like that vulnerability is kind of what led me into that season of deception. And so she's been good about that. And, um, you know, honestly, she's been a great advocate um, for my growth in faith. And I'd like to think that one of the things that she said is like, we have to offer grace to each other um, and realize like, we're human, we're not God. We can't hold each other to that standard. But I think it's kind of like what we see inside of our community too. It's like we're members of the body of Christ and we're all serving these different functions and they are complementary in many respects to one another. So like where I'm weak, she is strong. Where, you know, I'm strong, she may be a little weaker, but it's like together we're functioning properly in a marriage as one cohesive unit when we are both truly in complete surrender to God and we're allowing him to work through us and utilize our gifts properly. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what it comes down to is like not trying to be someone you're not, just allowing God to work through you, you know, like being a willing and obedient servant in your marriage. And that can be hard at times because like we, again, like we get caught up in our feelings in marriage. Like there's a lot of stuff that you encounter. Um, yeah. Well, and that was to my point, like, so even though you're not perfect, like when, um, as, as a wife, when you think about like, you know, people don't like the word submit, but like submitting to your husband, it's not because like he's perfect and he knows everything or, um, you know, that like you have it all together and I don't, that's definitely not it, but but if you're viewing it in the sense that like, you know, God, God put him in my life for a reason and I can trust that, you know, I can trust him because yeah. he trusts God. And if I know that he is in God's word, if I know that, you know, that God is his number one, then I ultimately can trust that. And that's such a critical point is to put God first in your marriage. Like you can't put your spouse above him. No. He always has to be number one. And then your spouse will benefit from that. But that point that she just hit on as it relates to trust is like huge because with the walls that had 
you know, perhaps been up in earlier parts of our relationship, like there were trust concerns and things because you just never felt like you were having the depth of like the conversations, like the communication wasn't, you know, what it should have been. And so it was like, do I really know her, you know, or does, do, does she really know me? Like if we're not on that level of intimacy, there's like these unknowns and these kind of fears, but like when you're surrendered to God and you're bare before him, then you have the ability to come bare before your spouse too. And like the level of trust and connection that that breeds is huge. Like there's a different level of loyalty and things there, right? Like, it's like, you know, we know we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. We may, we may wrestle and tug at each other for a couple of days or we may get angry and fight or whatever, but like we're in it for the long haul um, because that's, that's our commitment. We made that commitment before him. He's blessed us richly with three and now four children. Mm -hmm. um, like we're going to honor that and um, we're going to stick together. It's a war out there. Like, and maybe that's a good place to close too is because I mean, I feel like the enemy is always trying to divide us and marriage is one of those areas that is just like a critical target. And um, I know a lot of marriages are under stress and strain right now because of all the opposing forces of the world. You know? Yeah. And would it surprise anyone that if the devil was going to try and make one last stand, like that that would be the first place that he would go to attack? Because if you destroy the marriage and you destroy, you know, the kids and the next generation, like it, it's just, it's a nightmare. Um, and it snowballs extraordinarily quickly. So um, we do not by any means have everything figured out. We've really, I think that's one of the big things too, is mm -hmm. admitting you have nothing figured out. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. We're learning as we go. We don't know squat. We just literally surrender to him and, you know, he provides the answers, but it's literally a day by day process. Yeah. Um, I mean, we grow and mature in our faith, sure. But like, as far as like coming to the conclusions that help us get through life, like that's literally just an utter reliance on God one day at a time. Yeah. So anyway, we hope that this podcast has blessed you as much as it has blessed us. I honestly mean that she's laughing, but this was something that I have desired for a long time. And um, yeah. I know, and I'm glad I did it, but I will say this before this started, I probably would have rather gone and given birth <laughs> and done See, now she can get, like, we weren't going to get this done, though, like, after the child came. So, praise the Lord. Like, what an awesome thing. And this will live forever, you know. Our kids can listen to it someday, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, but I hope that it has touched your hearts. Um, you know, this is a unique thing. We're not going to be doing all these you know, marriage profiles and all likelihood on the Disciple podcast. But I just thought this was a great opportunity given that Valentine's Day is coming and our anniversary is coming. And this has just been something that God placed on my heart since the beginning of the vision for Discipled over a year ago that this had to be done, like to kind of complete the puzzle. And um, I feel like this is awesome. I am just so blessed to have her with me. I love her more now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love you too. Um, so anyway, thank you guys for joining us. God bless you all. Come back to the Disciple Podcast. Um, we're going to have more powerful testimonies from our men, as well as some roundtables and things of that nature. So it's, it's just getting good, guys. Tip of the iceberg. Uh, we love you all. God bless. <laughs>